We have breaking news at this hour from the New York Times under the headline, Secret Memo Laid Out Strategy for Trump to Overturn Biden's Win. The New York Times is reporting on a memo that was cited in Jack Smith's indictment of Donald Trump. This is a memo that was never found by the January 6th committee. It is from an, an attorney named Kenneth Cheeseborough, and it says that the New York Times reports a copy obtained by the New York Times shows for the first time that the lawyer, Kenneth Cheeseborough, acknowledged from the start that he was proposing a bold, controversial strategy that the Supreme Court likely would reject in the end. But even if the plan did not ultimately pass legal muster at the highest level, Mr. Cheeseborough argued that it would achieve two goals. It would focus attention on claims of voter fraud and, quote, buy the Trump campaign more time to win litigation that would deprive Biden of electoral votes and or add to the Trump column. Mr. Cheeseborough cited writings by a Harvard Law professor, Lawrence H. Tribe, to bolster his argument that the deadlines and procedures in the Electoral Count Act are unconstitutional and that state electoral votes need not be finalized until Congress's certification on January 6th. Mr. Cheeseborough had worked as Mr. Tribe's research assistant as a law student and later helped him in his representation of Vice President Al Gore during the 2000 election, calling his former mentor a key Biden supporter and fervent Trump critic. Mr. Cheeseborough cited what he described as Mr. Tribe's legal views, along with writings by several other liberals, as potential fodder for a messaging strategy. It would be the height of hypocrisy for Democrats to resist January 6th as the real deadline or to suggest that Trump and Pence would be doing anything particularly controversial. He wrote, joining us now is Professor Lawrence Tribe, who has taught constitutional law at Harvard Law School for five decades. Uh, Professor Tribe, you're right in the middle of tonight's breaking news story uh, by the New York Times, which I know you've had time to read. Uh, what is your reaction to uh, what you've discovered about yourself in this memo that the Times is just reporting on? Well, I have to, I have to say I didn't recognize myself. <laughs> And I haven't often been fodder uh, for anything. What Ken Chesborough did was take stuff that I had said in the year 2000 about Florida and that Florida law didn't set a deadline just before midnight, December 12, but allowed counting all the way up until January 6th, the date of the joint session, and in fact, maybe even beyond. That was about Florida law. Remember Tim Russert said that the 2000 election all came down to Florida, Florida, Florida? Well, this was not Florida, Florida, Florida. It was Wisconsin, Georgia, Pennsylvania, a number of other states. I never said anything remotely like what Mr. Chesborough cut and pasted some of my words to make it sound like I had said. I never said or suggested or would even be caught dead thinking that Congress didn't have power through the Electoral Count Act to dictate how the process is supposed to be conducted on January 6th. So he just, he was scouting around um, my little piece in Just Security today that was quoted in the New York Times is called Anatomy of a Fraud. It does turn out that the fraud was Kenneth Chesborough. He dreamed it up. He's a lot smarter, actually, unprincipled, it turned out, but a lot smarter than John Eastman, who I don't think could have come up with all of this. Basically, he plotted how to take a little snippet here and a little snippet there and through a kind of recombinant DNA, made up a bunch of non-law, which would not only be rejected by the Supreme Court nine to nothing, but just made no sense at all. So, you know, I'm, I guess I'm flattered to, to be fodder, I suppose, uh, but it just shows how fraudulent it all was and how no reasonable lawyer could possibly believe it. You know, this is not like giving legal advice. Lawyers can give advice, but when lawyers help to build a machine 
to tear down the republic and the government and to prevent the transition of power by, among other things, making factually false statements. A lot of statements in that memo, the newly discovered one, and in one that had also featured in the indictment, a memo that the Chesborough wrote on November 16th, when it had become clear that even the lawyers for Trump said that they had lost Arizona and therefore by their own count, they'd lost the election. In the November 16th memo, he had laid out all of the groundwork for this elaborate plot to use phony electors meeting in places that were not legal to meet, signing certificates that were fraudulent. The whole thing was factually false and legally inventive, but completely empty. That's what the House of Cards is all about. And we almost lost our republic over it. Thank God for people like Mike Ludwig, who persuaded, you know, persuaded um, the vice president that he couldn't go along with the plot. Your, your former student, uh, Mr. Chesbrough, is uh, listed as a co-conspirator, not by name, in uh, Jack Smith's uh, indictment. And, and, and he says when he's offering this, I don't want to call it a legal opinion, when he's offering this tactic, uh, he says, of course, the Supreme Court will knock it down. The Supreme Court will will not uphold it, but it will buy us time. Now, right. now it's that time. is not that, that, I'm just, that is a a political tactician's uh, advice. That that is right. not a lawyer's advice. That's right. He basically said we can buy time, and what is it time for? It's time for the vice president to exercise a power he doesn't have and send things back for a 10-day delay on the 6th of January, right up until four days before the inauguration, send them back so the state legislatures can exercise some magical power, regardless of what Congress says, regardless of the slates that had already been certified by the governor, to name new slates. That is basically buy time to make the coup work, buy time so that perhaps with the violent pressure that we put on Mike Pence with that uh, hang, hangman's noose hanging there, buy time so that we can pressure Pence to violate the Constitution. It, it's, it's really staggering. And the people like my friend and colleague Jack Goldsmith who say, oh, it's not a good idea to bring this indictment, it's very difficult. I couldn't agree more with Neil Katyal that for this indictment not to have been brought would really be to give up on the democratic experiment for good. Because if a president can use all of his powers, even when he loses an election, to get some creep like Chesborough to use his law license to help him stage a bloodless coup, and then if it doesn't work, have blood spilled in the streets. If that's our fate, then we are not going to be able to have a self-governing life. We will be living under tyranny. And I don't want to live under a tyranny. I don't think any of your viewers do. If uh, Mr. Chesbrough testifies in this case or becomes a criminal defendant at some point in this case, and if uh, Jack Smith wants your testimony, uh, in this case, in relation to that memo that you are cited in, uh, would you testify in this case? Would you comply with that? Of course, I would comply with any subpoena, any any request to testify. The reason I wrote the piece that I did in Just Security was that I thought all of us as citizens who have any information relevant to these charges have a duty to come forward and, and present it. And that's exactly what I did. I would be honored to to say it under oath. I want to go to one piece, uh, the, the sort of shortest version of the Trump criminal uh, defense. We'll listen to it now, presented by John Loro, uh, the First Amendment defense. Let's listen to this. 
Every single thing that President Trump is being prosecuted for involved aspirational asks, asking state legislatures, asking state governors, asking state electoral officials to do the right thing. In fact, even asking Vice President Pence was protected by free speech. None of that is illegal. (laughs) Professor Tribe, your reaction to that? It's hard to know where to start. I mean, that might work with some of the base listening, you know, because words were used when Mr. Raffensperger was told, um, just find me 11,780 votes or maybe you'll be prosecuted. That's an ask. Give me your money or I'll shoot you. That's, I guess that's aspirational. Please give me your money or I'll shoot you. I mean, all fraud, all blackmail is committed with words, conspiracies, or agreements to undertake a coup, use words. There is speech involved, but none of it is protected speech. And the indictment is extremely carefully written, not even to make anything of the president's incitement at the ellipse. There's no way I could have imagined taking the First Amendment out of this case more thoroughly than Jack Smith managed to do by his carefully crafted indictment. Well, the breaking news of this evening is Friday at 10 p.m. That is when the judge in the newest prosecution of Donald Trump will convene the first hearing in that case. Yesterday, federal judge Tanya Chutkin asked the lawyers in the case to agree on two possible dates and times that they would all be available, both sides would be available for a hearing this week. Jack Smith's team of prosecutors made it very easy on the judge, saying they would all be available at any time, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And then Donald Trump's lawyers replied that they would not be available on Thursday because one of them has to appear in the case against Donald Trump in Florida on Thursday. The Trump lawyers then asked the judge to schedule the hearing for Monday or Tuesday of next week. And at 5.24 p.m. this evening, the judge issued an order saying the court hereby scheduled a hearing on the party's respective protective order proposals in this matter on August 11th, which is Friday, at 10 a.m. The primary business of that hearing is to consider what Donald Trump and his lawyers will be allowed to say publicly about the evidence in the case that will be handed over to them by Jack Smith and his team of prosecutors. This is a standard issue to be dealt with in cases like this that include grand jury testimony, which both sides have already agreed cannot be made public by Donald Trump and his lawyers. But Donald Trump is pretending that Jack Smith is trying to take away his First Amendment rights. We'll be joined tonight by a panel of legal experts, Neil Katyal, Gwen Keyes Fleming, and Bradley Moss, who will consider the Trump defense arguments. Also joining us tonight, as I just said, will be Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe to respond to some of what Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyer has been saying and to respond to reporting in The New York Times tonight about that memo. In a moment, we'll show you some video of Donald Trump speaking in New Hampshire today, claiming that Jack Smith's motion for a protective order on the evidence in the case is an attempt to take away Donald Trump's First Amendment rights. Donald Trump does not tell the crowd that his criminal defense attorneys have already agreed to most of the restrictions that Jack Smith's protective order is asking for. So that would mean, according to Donald Trump, that his criminal defense lawyers are also trying to take away his First Amendment rights. The thug prosecutor, this deranged guy, to file a court order taking away my First Amendment rights so that I can't speak. So listen to this. So in other words, I'll be the only politician in American history not allowed to speak because of our corrupt system. Leading off our discussion tonight, Neil Katyal, former acting U.S. Solicitor General and host of the podcast Courtside with Neil Katyal, Gwen Keyes Fleming, a former district attorney in DeKalb County, Georgia, and Bradley Moss, a national security attorney who represents people working in the defense community. Uh, Neil Katyal, uh, Donald Trump's First Amendment rights. Is Jack Smith trying to take away his First Amendment rights? 
Well, Trump is right. He is the first politician, or at least the first president, to be accused of several serious federal felonies, now with two different indictments. The idea that this has to do with his First Amendment rights is bogus through and through. And I think Jack Smith debunked it in a filing earlier this week before Judge Chetkin. What he said is, look, I'm not trying to undermine your First Amendment rights. You're allowed to speak and so on. But there's a difference between speaking and intimidating witnesses. And Trump was warned about this, Lawrence, at his arraignment in an extraordinary moment last week with the judge. The judge said, look, you can't to go and try and influence jurors and things like that. He said he understood. And then within 24 hours, here he is threatening, you know, basically, you know, intimidating witnesses from Mike Pence and saying, if you, don't, if you come after me, I'll come after you to the whole world and so on. This is not the way in any other criminal trial could operate. And if you let this defendant get away with it, then every other defendant can get away with it. There's no First Amendment right here. Trump is right that it is his speech, it's his social media post and what he says about Pence. It is verbalized through speech, but it is impermissible every day of every week because intimidation of witnesses often occurs through speech, and yet it's punishable and separately protect, you know, protective orders and other things are used. So what the judge, what the government is seeking here, the special counsel, is absolutely reasonable. I think Trump's arguments are going nowhere. And instead of spending all this time sending tweets and chatting with the press, I think his lawyer should spend some time, you know, formulating a decent argument.